And we're back. We're going to pick up right where we left off from the last video, which was the end of constructors, and we're going to get into a concept which is rather very complicated in C++, which is the concept of operator overloading. Essentially, if I could explain operator overloading in one sentence, it would be, what if I told you that all the code you're reading that's been written in C++ is lying to you about what's really happening? And that's essentially what C out is, and that's essentially what operator overloading allows you to do. It allows you to take very complicated operations and hide them or mask them behind simple operators between two objects. The easiest way I can explain that is to explain exactly what an operator is to C++ syntactically. This is not true of C, but C++, when the code is compiled, you can think of every operator essentially as a function call. So let me explain. What is an operator? Well, as I probably showed you guys in the original C video, operators is a plus, minus, um, you know, the, le the less than up there in that for loop, less than equal, not. Um, parentheses to call a function. Subscript operator, square brackets to get at the index of an array. Um, geez, what else? Casting is considered an operator when you cast something to int, like on the left. Um, Assignment, when you assign one variable to another, they're all operators and they all can be overloaded. So first off, you're probably wondering what the hell am I talking about. So if I declare something like an int, i, and j, I can do many things with i that essentially are operator calls. However, the compiler, when you're working with primitive types such as int, will just basically assume, you know what, you just want to do something simple. So for example, if I say int r, and I say r equals i plus j. Assume these are set to something useful like 1 and 2 or something. Um, this is actually interpreted to the compiler sort of as a function call if it could be. Now that's not really the case with ints, but if these were more complicated objects then, then it would be. So let me explain. This is basically syntactically, synta syntactically the same as doing r dot operator plus two arguments. Sorry, not r i dot operator plus two arguments. First one is implied as being this, which is i, which is the left-hand side of the argument. The second one is j. I know that looks nuts. And then what happens immediately in the same line is r dot operator assignment, assign r the value of i plus j, which is basically the result of what was up there. So I could compose these things together into one insane third line, which would basically be i dot operator r dot operator assignment equals i dot operator plus j. Now this is going to make zero sense to you but I want to explain essentially what is going on when you when you use an operator between two things in C++. Binary operators which are operators that have a left side and a right side they basically take two arguments. Those, those operators take two arguments. Unary operators such as the not will take one. So for example not i would basically look like um, i dot operator not with no arguments. Now if you actually go to write this code i dot operator I'm pretty sure it wouldn't compile. The whole reason I talked about all this crap is what if i was not i what if it was some class type like you know something you invented. Now you can basically make everything I just wrote including assignment plus subtraction anything you want to do that involves an operator you can make those things actually defined so that they compile. Now, if you tried to do this in C with structs, it would flip out and be like, how the hell do I add two bananas together? That doesn't make any sense. However, in C++, you can write the code to define what these operators do and how they should behave. And you can write some really awesome looking code with this kind of crap. So let me explain to you what I mean after commenting all of this junk out and possibly erasing it because I'm crazy and I don't need it anymore. So all the way up to this in erase C, right? Well, suppose that we wanted to be dumb and we didn't know in advance that we wanted to make a copy constructor call with C. So for example, suppose we just declare C like so and then immediately decide, hey, we want to set C equal to A. Now the compiler no longer knows that this is a copy constructor. It's assumed that the object's already been constructed. At this point, anything can be inside C. It's a completely different operation than doing a copy constructor and you need to define what the assignment operator does when you do this. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to show you how. So, 
I'm starting to think this is one of the most complicated videos in the entire series. Operator overloading syntax is very, very hard to understand at first. So let me show you what that syntax looks like. We wanted to find an assignment operator, which is the equals sign, not the double equals, that's different, um, for the interray class. So basically what we do is we provide the return value, which is void. Doesn't have to be, sometimes people say, as a matter of fact, it shouldn't be void, but I don't want to make this any more confusing than it should be, so we're going to make it void. Um, so it's going to be void operator, the operator that we want to overload, and then the arguments to the function. The first argument is assumed to be the caller, since we're inside a class, this is a member function or a method. The first argument is assumed to be the caller. The second argument, we're basically allowing us to assign int array to another array, which is going to be very similar to the copy constructor implementation from the past video. So let me show you what this looks like when we actually implement this. I'm going to put this just below the copy constructor because it's basically, basically going to do the same thing. So a couple things are going to happen here. For starters, we need to put the scope resolution operator in front of the thing just like we always do. And for seconders, we basically need to provide the exact same code inside here that we did before. However, with one major caveat. We need to know what we're going to do with the data I don't feel like dealing with syntax highlighting inside my strings right now. So we are basically going to, um, we need to make sure we dispose of whatever data might have been inside interray um, before it called to the assignment operator, essentially kind of acting like we're the destructor beforehand. So in this case, basically what I'm going to do is before I clobber whatever data was already inside of me, I make sure that I free it properly. And I'm going to add one more check here just to make sure data isn't null before I do this, and that's going to come up and become important as we move on. Because essentially, um, yes, I want to make sure that I do that to be safe. So after writing all this code, we basically define what happens. When we set C equal to A, this function gets called, instead of the assignment operator, whatever data was provided by the initial construction of the integer array is freed, and then we basically do the same thing as the, uh, the copy constructor. If I run this and it doesn't crash, we're good. Notice it says assignment operator, not copy constructor, from what essentially was C equal to A, and everything works just fine. Now, the, what, there's something kind of bothering me about this, and this will, you'll see this with a lot of computer scientists don't like to write inefficient code, and essentially, when you start working on a class, the more complicated it gets, the more complicated your assignment operator is going to be, and also the more complicated your copy constructor is going to be. They're essentially the exact same damn code, and maintaining two separate pieces of code that do the same thing just screams bad practice in C++. So a lot of times what you will see somebody do is they will set up a way to ensure that they can run the same function call for both cases of copy construction and operator. And the way that looks essentially is you delete this, you write star this equals, believe it or not, r, to the right-hand side, and this is very common practice for people to do this. It basically says provide a const reference on the left or a non-const reference on the right, call the assignment operator, set it equal to r. It's very similar to if I would said this operator equals r, but of course no one in their right mind would write code like this. So basically this is the this is the syntactically correct way to reuse the assignment operator. However, it's really important to make sure that data is null before going in here, and it needs to know that there was nothing to free before in this case, so we just make sure that data is equal to the null pointer before going into the assignment operator. When we do this, we could basically interchange usages of the assignment operator, which is the equal sign operator, and the uh, copy constructor, and have them reuse the same code. This is beautiful. This is a clean, proper way to write an integer array class, but we are not done, because operator overloading is crazy and there's a lot you can do, and there's no way I'm going to be able to cover it in one video. This would be like an entire chapter of a C++ book, but we're going to go kind of deep here. So, What other kind of operators would we like to overload? Well, there's one that I'm thinking about that's kind of interesting. Um, what if I wanted to add another assignment operator and let me assign this to something insane, like just a plain old int? Now, why would you do that, right? Why would you be able to assign an array to an int? Well, as a designer of this class, I want to be able to enable this thing to be very uh, convenient to use as a developer. And maybe there's going to be a case where me as the user of this class or somebody else who's using it is always creating arrays that contain just one int initially. So maybe being able to do something like this is kind of neat. 
So maybe we'll provide shorthand to basically allow us to just, just make this happen. So basically what I'm going to do in this case is implement a very similar... Well, I'm going to reuse the code above. So basically I'm going to create an integer array that contains just one element. I'm going to set that one element to i. And then I'm basically going to do once again star this equals temp. And now we basically are able to implement code or use code that assigns the integer array to one ob to a one um, uh, integer. I seem to have made a mistake. Um, oh, it should be index. Of course, I just care about the first index here. So there we go. So what would this look like if we did this? Um, well. If I wanted to print um, c.get10, if I wanted to set c immediately equal to 5 and basically just have an array of one element, which is 5, and then get the first index, it'll basically print 5. And we'll see that immediately there's some dialic calls here because I basically clobbered what was inside c before. And um, that's really cool that that all just kind of works out for me. So. That's one example of another operator, but that's just reusing the assignment operator. That's not that interesting. What would happen instead if we wanted to define an operator like an addition operator? So maybe operator plus another array. Well, what, what would that mean to add two arrays together? Well, some people might say just like with a C++ string, this could be just concatenation. So believe it or not, this is something the C++ string class actually supports, the plus sign adding two strings together, and I believe it just concatenates them. So maybe we'll do that with the array so that if we add A and B together, the first 100 elements of C will be A, and the next 200 will be B, just back-to-back -back concatenations of, the, of, of the, uh, the array objects. So let's try to um, implement that and see what that would look like. So notice now we're using the plus operator and not the assignment operator. And this is going to return basically a brand new object, and it's basically going to look something like this. So this is temp, or really it should be called ret. We know it's going to have my size plus r dot size elements, and we know that for the first i, it's going to take the callers, which is the left hand side of the plus, as elements. So actually, this should, this would be better off using memcopy. Memcopy is always more efficient than a for loop that's going to iterate through the elements if, if you can get away with using it. So memcopy basically says I want to take ret's data, set it equal to my data, and size times size of int elements are copied. And then immediately I'd like to follow it up with um, ret's data for the offsetted um, for b, basically. So r dot data, the second argument. Now, however, I can't just immediately start copying this to the beginning of the array again. That wouldn't make any sense. So essentially what I'd like to do is actually take the um, array data and offset it by size elements. If this doesn't make any sense to you, and it might not, you might want to go watch my pointer, pointers video and advanced concepts uh, from the C tutorial series where I talk about pointer arithmetic. But basically what this does is it says copy to the array size offsets from the base so that we're basically not clobbering the data that was there before. Um, this I believe will work. Essentially now when we return ret, it'll make sure that the associated copy constructors get called because we're returning ret by value. It's the only way this could work. And the copy construction will basically just be ran so that the operator assignment will work. If we were implementing plus equals, then we maybe would do it to ourselves, but we are not. Um, so let's see what that would look like. Int array C equals A plus B. There's going to be a lot going on there. It looks like there's going to be a copy constructor call here, and there's going to be the A plus B happening there. And I'd like to see what 101 would look like. I also haven't initialized B yet up here. I'm just going to really quickly do that. Instead of maybe being I times 2, it'll be I times 4. So let's just do that to make sure that I don't have any uninitialized data here. So long story short, when I run this, if I don't get build errors, which I do, um, this one cannot return void, and it looks like I did make it return void. So the return value for this one is another integer array. Not a reference, not a pointer. It's returning a, a valid um, by value copy. So now it should run.
and it did. And basically what this does is it gives me the first index of B, which is basically going to be the 101st index of A. Um, possibly even the 100th, actually. This should be 0 if I do this. Yeah. So um, just to prove to you guys that this isn't the only class that can do this, if I pull in string now, it'd be very similar to me basically saying string C equals uh, S1. You know, I basically can do uh, the same thing with strings. And because, because operator overloading works, this is essentially why this works when you do something like this. Come on. Oh, I didn't use namespace std. So there we go. There's another example of operator overloading. Um, before I, there's so much I can talk about with operator overloads, but I don't want this video to go on forever because um, there's a lot to this, and this is all supposed to just be kind of a bird's eye view of this stuff anyway. So. Let me comment some of this junk out so we can clean up our logs here. And we're going to cover one more type of an operator overload, even though there's so many more that we could. Uh, in order to make a proper array, you actually have to define so many operators, it's insane. But the one that's the most important that I want to talk about um, will explain at least a little bit about how you might implement an array class and have it act more like a, a C array, even though it's not. So that operator is the subscript operator, and it basically looks like this. int, because we're an array of ints, operator, square brackets, and then one argument, which is basically an integer index. It doesn't have to be an integer. It could actually be something more interesting, but in this case, we just want to use an integer index. And this is basically going to provide the exact same thing as the get function, but it's going to be implemented using the integer operator. What would that look like, you ask? Well, it basically is the similar syntax that we're used to seeing now already, which operators, but basically what I make sure that I do is I return data. I do a safety check first, because that would be stupid to not do that, and then I return data index all the same. Once I do this, I basically have a I basically have a method that acts just like you would expect an array to act, or at least almost. This is the same reason why strings actually allow you to do subscripting as well, which you probably saw me do from the uh, string example video a few videos back. So what would this look like? Well, instead of c.get101, maybe I want to do c square bracket 101 instead. And this syntax works simply because I just initial, or, uh, implemented and told the compiler what this means for this object which is just subscripting. So there we go, that worked. Um, there's one thing that really would bother me though if I left it just like this, and that is if I want to do assign this to something, I no longer can because it's basically saying this expression is not assignable. You're returning um, what's basically called a R value, I think. I get my R values and L values confused, but basically it means you're returning a constant that cannot be assigned. This is something that's only meant to be read, and you can't assign it. There's a way to fix that, and it's a very, very clever trick in C++ um, that you're already familiar with, and that's reference parameters. As I told you guys, when you create a reference parameter, a reference parameter can be assigned, and you'll assign the underlying object that you're re referencing. So basically, you can change the reference values through the assignment operator. In other words, you could basically do something like this, assignment, and then basically what you want to set the thing equal to. But when it's a reference parameter, you don't need to put the arrow. You just put the dot. And that's basically what happens. So how do we make this a reference? You're going to laugh. All you really have to do is change one character. Non-const reference return value. We're basically, when we do this, allowing... There we go, one character. We are allowing the compiler access via reference to our data. Now this will almost work, but you cannot return a reference to zero. So what I do in this case is I just create some global up here. 
and this is basically going to be our safety check failure variable that gets passed as a reference in case they go outside of the bounds of something. It basically means that this is a no-op when they do this. Wrong variable. Because you cannot return a reference to something that does not have memory somewhere, and zero as a literal does not. So that covers the assignment operator, or that, that covers the subscripting operator, and as you can see, when I do this, it works exactly as you would expect, which is awesome. So I know I probably just destroyed your minds, um, but if you watch this video and take it slow or um, read up more about operator overloading, this stuff does eventually make sense. I'm actually amazed that I'm able to recall this stuff from memory. I used to have to look this up for the first even three or four years of, of doing C++ on the regular. Uh, so don't feel bad if this stuff looks like Greek at first, but um, it's extremely powerful. Um, and the best part is now I can finally show you guys C out because I can explain what the hell C out is. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I also recommend you guys looking up why most assignment operators do not return void. I just left this here for simplicity because this video is already complicated enough that this is not necessarily the way to do this, but I'd like to move on to see out uh, before this video becomes way too long. All right, so I'm going to save all these and close all these. and create another C++ file for you guys. Alright, so finally we can talk about C out, which most people would have already taught you about by now, but this syntax wouldn't make any sense to you if you didn't know what assignment operators were, or namespaces, or anything. For starters, I don't like not being inside the namespace STD. So as you guys could probably guess, um, Cout is a special class, it's a global instance of the iStream class, or the OStream class, that basically anything that you send to it will go to the output of the console. And what's really neat is it's actually provided overloaded operators that can take many arguments that are well understood, and every time you send anything at Cout, whether it is an integer, or a string, which I just did, or a floating point value, it basically knows what to do with it. So it's a common version of function overloads, but it's also a version of operator overloads. What they basically did was took the previously known bit shift operator from C and decided to use that as kind of their insertion operator so that this becomes a function call. And then they take the return value of that function call and return C out again by reference so that basically C out is then called between these two things, which was basically from this on the left side and this on the right side. And they do that so you can stream as many of these things as you want back to back and everything just works just fine. When you're first looking at it though and you don't know what operator overloads are, you're probably wondering why this is the first time you see this kind of syntax in C++ and almost nowhere else. Because most people don't implement their classes this way simply because it's kind of confusing. But for C out, it just kind of happens to work. Um, another interesting thing, which is really nice, is that it does understand how to work with its own string class. You no longer have to include C string to print something out. So, for example, if I did string s equals slal, um, you would be able to print that out without having to call C string on it because C out knows how to work with its own standard C++ types.